the, uh, the panel members, Christopher Booker, a real skeptic, Ian Murray, an expert in many areas, and Yaron Brock, who uh, is a PhD, but also a, the leader of an organization that is a libertarian in every sense of the word, uh, who represents the uh, Ayn Rand Institute. I don't ever do AYN very well, so I'm doing the best I can. I'm John Don. I'm an emergency physician from Texas and an inactive lawyer, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not dangerous, <laughs> at least not most of the time. As a physician, I want you to, I want you to understand that I, know, I don't consider myself to be a scientist at a scientific convention. Medicine is a very soft science. It's almost like practicing social sciences. You kind of push here and you push there and then you see what happens. You really don't have to measure much and when it comes down to it, I feel like I'm in the, uh, I'm in a, in a group of real scientists when I'm talking to chemists and physicists and meteorologists and, but these folks are idea guys. And I don't know what the order is. First. Booker first. <laughs> right. Mr. Booker's from England. He is uh, a contrarian, I think an extraordinary contrarian, and uh, I think that's the best way to describe him. And uh, we're pleased to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, John. That's really good of you. Now, I think you should know that a university near where I live in England has just also been having a conference on climate change this weekend. And it was led by one of their senior professors, a group of what were called eco-psychologists, were solemnly discussing how they could get climate change denial classified as a serious mental disorder. So good morning, fellow lunatics. It's a great honor for me to be part of this historic conference, and it's been such a delight over the last two days to see all such uh, so many great men that I've been writing about uh, back in Britain over the last year or two. Professor Lindzen, obviously, President Klaus, Fred Singer. Not to mention those two heroes of our time who we follow avidly almost hour by hour on their blogs, Anthony Watts and Steve McIntyre. Now, we're all aware that thanks to global warming, the world is heading for an unprecedented, unprecedented catastrophe. But it is not, of course, the technicolor apocalypse that we've been told about so often by Jim Hansen and Al Gore. Melting ice caps, hurricanes, floods, droughts, and all those things. The real disaster hanging over us through global warming lies in all those measures now being adopted by the world's politicians to meet a crisis which was never going to happen. Never before in history have so many have politicians come up with proposals so astronomically costly and so potentially damaging to their and indeed our economies. Some of us back in Britain thought our own politicians were crazy enough when last year they voted unanimously, almost unanimously, to make it the law of the land that within 40 years, Britain must cut its carbon dioxide emissions by an insane 80%. Goodbye economy. Then you guys voted in President Obama who's pledged to do much the same thing. Stop breathing out, Mr. President. Everyone speaking at that, this conference has their own angle, their own individual angle on the great theme which has brought us all together. In my own case, I first came to this subject in a serious way when a, a year or two back, I, with a co-author, Dr. North, we were putting together a book on a subject we did know quite a lot about. For 15 years, we'd found ourselves investigating a long succession of those scares which have become such a conspicuous feature of Western life in the recent decades. Repeatedly, we had seen supposed experts hitting the headlines by raising some supposedly terrifying new threat to human health or well-being. Food scares, such as mad cow disease, which was going to kill by now half a million people every year. Um, the Asian bird flu, which the WHO back in 2005 predicted would soon be killing 150 million people. 2YK, the millennium bug, which was going to bring civilized life to a halt by knocking out millions of computer systems. Dioxins, lead in petrol, passive smoking, the deliberate confusion between different types of asbestos and so on. Again and again, we'd seen how these scares followed a remarkably similar pattern. 
Each of these supposed threats had originated in what would eventually turn out to be a misreading of the scientific evidence. Usually this was because scientists had put two things together and guessed incorrectly that one was the cause of the other. The scare had then been picked up and magnified by the media, by environmental lobby groups, and by some politicians, to the points where eventually governments gave way. And this was the tipping point of the scare as they proceeded to mount a massive legislative response to, out of all proportion to the reality of the threat. Now this had invariably resulted in huge financial and economic damage, often running into billions and even hundreds of billions of dollars. But finally, in each case, new evidence came to light to show how the supposed threat had been wildly exaggerated or was even wholly imaginary. The panic had been based not just on misreading the scientific data, but often on willfully distorting it. Now, what struck us when we came to look into the history of the global warming, or the alarm over global warming, was how uncannily it seemed to have echoed the pattern of all those other scares with which we were so familiar. There was the initial putting together of the two things, the rise in CO2 levels and the rise in temperatures, leading to the assumption that one must have been the cause of the other. There was the way in which this scare had been obsessively promoted by the media and environmental lobby groups, and then there was the remarkable speed with which this cause was taken up by governments as they rushed to propose a massive regulatory response. When we examined all this in detail, we had no hesitation in making it the subject of the longest chapter in our book, which was called Scared to Death, from BSE to Global Warming, How Scares Are Costing Us the Earth. But we finished the book in 2007, and of course since then the story's moved on a long way, and we are in fact in the middle of writing another new book which is wholly devoted to the subject which has brought us all together here this morning. The drama as we see it historically has unfolded in three parts. The first part, part one, which takes the story up to the beginning of, to, up to the signing of the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, we call the forging of a consensus. And this begins back in the 1970s with the brief panic over global cooling and behind the scenes, people like Bert Bolin, a Swedish meteorologist, are beginning to agitate hard on the subject of a potential global warming. Then, of course, temperatures did begin to rise and certain scientists began to ascribe this, or more scientists began to ascribe this due to a rise in greenhouse gas levels. And then in 1988, two things happened to set the Great Scare on its way. The first of these, which was uh, made big headlines over here in the States, was Jim Hansen's carefully stage-managed testimony to that Senate committee in June 1988, claiming that the five hottest years ever recorded were in the 1980s and that 1988 was going to be the hottest yet. But the second, quite independently, happening across the Atlantic in Geneva, was the setting up by a small group of met meteorologists led by Bert Bolin, that Swede, of the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Only 29 people turned up for that first meeting which set up the IPCC, and they were most of them government-appointed meteorologists. As we know, the IPCC was to become, through its series of reports, a, an absolutely key central player in the whole of the story. Yet the more that comes to light about its workings, the more we see, and I'm sure most of you will be familiar with the idea of this, what a very odd body the IPCC is. It was always essentially a political rather than a scientific organization. It was tightly controlled from the start by a very small group of wholly committed meteorologists led by Bolin himself, the first chairman, and Dr. John Houghton from our own UK Met Office. And they accepted the idea of human-induced climate change, as they called it, as a given fact. And although its reports to this day are still described by many of my colleagues in the media routinely as 2,500 of the world's top climate scientists have got a cons consensus on, on climate change, as we know, only a few dozen of its, of its contributors are strictly climate scientists, and most of them are not really scientists at all. Now, one of the characteristics of a scare is that although there are usually experts who spot very early on that the science has gone off the rails, such is the momentum of a scare psychologically and socially that they, any objections can be brushed aside. When the IPCC produced its first report in 1990, for instance, Professor Lindzen, more knowledgeable as a climatologist than anyone on the IPCC, pointed out that the, uh, even at that early stage how hopelessly skewed the computer models were on which 
the IPCC was basing all its projections because of all the crucial factors that they missed out, such as the negative feedback effect of water vapor, the biggest greenhouse gas of all. Then the second report in 1996, uh, of course, uh, provoked that magisterial blast by Professor, the late Professor Frederick Seitz in the Wall Street Journal, who said, in effect, that in all his 60 years as a scientist, he'd never seen such a grotesque corruption of the basic scientific methodology and procedure. But the bandwagon was by this time unstoppably on its way. We had the famous Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, drawing up the UN Convention on Climate Change, and that led directly five years later to the Kyoto Protocol, committing virtually all the governments in the world, at least in theory, to what was now accepted as the consensus view that CO2-induced global warming was a major threat to the future of the planet. Part two of the story, as we tell it, lasting from 1998 to 2007, we call the consensus carries all before it. The official science grew even wilder, wilder and the symbol of that supreme symbol, as we're all familiar with, was the adoption and the ultimate total promotion by the IPCC in its 2001 report of the infamous hockey stick graph. And no matter that within a few years, Steve McIntyre and Ross McKittrick and, and indeed many others had turned that hockey stick into the, what I have often described as the most discredited artifact in the history of science. By this time, the, square, the scare was in such full swing that governments led by our own creature called the European Union proposed ever more ambitious measures to change the world's climate intended not just to meet their original Kyoto targets but by now going far beyond them. By 2005, as the EU launched, launched its first cap and trade venture, what's known as the Emissions Trading Scheme, much ap applauded by Al Gore, with tens of thousands of highly subsidized wind turbines beginning to rise uselessly over Europe's countryside, the hysteria was approaching its peak. 2006, of course, saw Al Gore's Oscar-winning film, so full of errors that scarcely a sentence in it was correct. By 2007, the potential bill for all the measures now being proposed by politicians across the world was so colossal that if they were all put into effect, it would require such a drastic change in the way of life of billions of people that it is hard to imagine how modern civilization could survive in any recognizable form. But then in the past two years, we have suddenly entered part three of the story, which we call the consensus begins to crumble. Firstly, although CO2 levels in the atmosphere have continued to rise, this has become clearer than ever that global temperatures are no longer following suit. Far from continuing to hurtle inexorably upwards, the temperature curve since that El Nino year of 1998 has flattened out and then dropped in a way, as we all know, that none of those IPCC computer models had predicted. As the past, over the past two years across the world, we've seen some of the heaviest snowfalls and coldest temperatures ever recorded, even the true believers in man-made global warming have now come up with new excuses to explain what is happening. We are told that although the world is temporarily getting cooler, thanks to shifts in ocean currents which those computer models somehow didn't allow for, this is only masking the underlying warming trend. And in due course, we're assured in 10 years, 20 years, whatever, uh, that dreadful warming will come back worse than ever. Secondly, it's also become increasingly clear that how, how much that va much vaunted scientific consensus was never anything like so unanimous as the politicians and the media were led to believe. Despite the tireless efforts of Dr. Mann, the evidence that the world was several times warmer in the few thousand years before the invention of SUVs remains overwhelming. Other theories to explain the temperature rise towards the end of the 20th century have become ever more convincing, notably those related to the activity of the sun. With increasing force and a growing number of climatologists and other experts have shown how the evidence for a human link to such warming has, has, has occurred in recent decades was not just being seriously exaggerated, exaggerated, but even deliberately manipulated to produce findings which the data simply did not justify. In a sense, it's been hilarious in the last year or two to see St Steve McIntyre yet again tearing apart man's latest bid to resurrect his hockey stick, just as it was to see McIntyre and Anthony Watts catching out James Hansen's Goddard Institute, fiddling its, its uh, temperature figures and forcing him to admit that US surface, surface temperatures were hotter in the 1930s than they were in the 1990s. Despite the best efforts of uh, Mann and Professor Stieg to splice together the temperature records from various weather stations, real and imaginary in the Antarctic, Antarctica stubbornly refuses, uh, it ref continues to get co cold, cooler, colder rather than warmer. 
That Arctic sea ice, so iconic, cussedly failed to vanish in 2008, as the BBC and others so longingly predicted it should. Even Al Gore's favorite picture of those two polar bears on a melting iceberg about to drown turns out to have been shot only a short distance from land because the wind-sculpted ice looked so pretty. Those bears weren't drowning, they were waving. <laughs> now, desperately, <clears throat> desperate to make reality fit their theories, the more fanatical warmists have given, grown ever more reckless in their claims as when Hansen talks of the death trains which carry coal to the power plants which <laughs> still supply the US with 50% of its electricity and predicts that a single planned coal-fired power station in Britain will alone be responsible for the extinction of 400 species. Just one power station, 400, not 401, not 399. You can't believe it. You can't make it up. But now a new, another new factor has entered the equation. Since last autumn, as we're all keenly aware, the global economy has been plunging into its deepest recession for more than 70 years as the clock ticks down towards next December when 10,000 politicians, officials, and environmental groupies co converge on Copenhagen to agree a success of the Kyoto Protocol, we've seen political attitudes towards global warming begin sharply to polarize. On the one hand, the majority of Western politicians, now led by your new president, are still firmly locked into their belief that the IPCC orthodoxy is correct, all those astronomically costly measures which they've been talking about for years from carbon taxes and cap and trade to building thousands more useless windmills are still as necessary as ever. But others, including several nations in the EU, have begun to argue that the immense economic sacrifices these would involve make them simply no longer available, affordable. Developing countries such as China and India continue to insist, as they have done ever since Kyoto, that if they are expected to cut back on their carbon emissions, the bill for this must be picked up by those developed countries whose economies are now in meltdown. I have five minutes. Do I really? I thought I'd overrun already. <laughs> right, five minutes you have. Less. Compared with where it was only a year or two back, the whole glo global warming picture, scientifically and politically, is now in a total shambles. Quite how the story will unfold from here, without that gift for foreseeing the future which is vouchsafed to the IPCC computer models, I would hesitate to predict. But I would certainly put money on Copenhagen as not being a very happy occasion for all our warmest friends, any more than was Jim Hansen's recent attempt to whip up the youth of the nation into a frenzy of protest against runaway global warming just after the Almighty had dumped six inches of snow all over Washington. I bet they were grateful for those coal-fired power stations when they got back in the warm. Now, as an epitaph for all that has happened in this story so far, I'll only recall the words of the late great Professor Aaron Wildavsky of Ber Berkeley when he described the panic over global warming as the mother of all environmental scares, and that was back in 1991. Part of the message I hope we can take out from this conference is that what we are confronted with here is precisely that, a scare, something we have seen so often before in history that we should become much readier than we are to recognize it and how it follows fixed patterns. When people are in the grip of a scare, they're carried away into a sentimental bubble of fear which not only detaches them from reality, but makes them unreason unreachable by reasoned arguments. So armored are they in their belief system that it is impossible to have dialogue with them they bristle with humorless indignation, they intone their empty, well-worn mantras, and they fly off only too easily into personal abuse. But even the most powerful of scares, as history teaches us, follow the same age, follows the same age-old age pattern and eventually will have its day. And in this battle, as I reminded, reminded Fred Singer a few months back when he was in rather a gloomy mood, we have two great allies. One is nature. The other is truth, and with allies like that, who can doubt that we shall prevail?